today is a big day. Today is a very, very big day. So first of all, we have uh, two excellent guests with us. One is Doug Simon and Graham will join us and we, we're going to talk about the Micronaut later. So let me just figure out how to do this, the thing. How to do the thing. Uh, right. Yeah, I think we are, we are right. Right, very good, very good. We have, we have Doug here on the screen. We have uh, Doug is now on the voice chat as well. Doug, how are you doing? Say hi. Hey, very good. Yes, I'm live and alive. Very, very good. Right, so I see you, I see the stream, everything is very healthy. Let's start. Without further ado, today we have a very exciting topic uh, that Doug is, of course, the, the lead of the compiler team and is responsible for many, many things within the GraalVM project and also has been with the project for uh, quite some time. Right, so from the very beginning, there I say that. Right, so if you have any questions, uh, I'm sure we can figure out how to ask them. Uh, so don't be shy and uh, ask the questions. This is, this is gonna be good. We have prepared the topic. So what we want to talk about today is uh, building the GraalVM project from scratch. Right, so GraalVM is, of course, uh, at the core of GraalVM, there is a uh, uh, com Oracle Graal, uh, the open source uh, components, which anyone can, can, can see uh, on GitHub and you can download them and build them and use them. Oh, look, the last commit is by Doug as well. <laughs> Four hours ago. Yeah, JDK 16 is coming to GraalVM or the other way around. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, JDK 16 is a big milestone. Right. So we're going to talk about building GraalVM. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, how GraalVM compiler, which is the, uh, the, the, the core component within the GraalVM works and how you can interact with the sources and maybe this, uh, make slight modifications of those and then how to build GraalVM with that. So I think at the end of the hour, what you will be able to do is what I hope we'll be able to do is to go from zero to have having nothing on the system knowing about GraalVM to understanding some internal parts of GraalVM, right? Uh, that the compiler, for example, operates in the graph and some corresponding classes that you can load into your ID and look at and, I don't know, debug those. We are all Java developers here, so I I think we can easily, easily just benefit from that knowledge and see a little bit behind the curtain how GraalVM is being made, uh, well, and what the team does kind of sort of daily. Uh, does it sound good? Works for me. Right, very, very good. Okay, so uh, let's let's do this. Uh, let me. I have my trusted cloud machine here, right? So, I have my trusted cloud machine here, and you can see that it's going to make it a little bit larger. We'll go to the streaming setup. I don't actually, yeah, and then live streams, right? So here, this is the repository. We're not going to mirror this to GitHub today because I don't think that makes a lot of sense, but we're gonna operate from this one directory uh, and we're gonna try to build a build, build a Graal VM first, right? So what do I need to, in order to do that, Doc? Right, the core components, of course, well, not of course, but uh, is the build tool, tool we use, MX. So you're gonna have to clone this one from GitHub. I, I think you have the URL somewhere. Right, so it's GraalVM slash MX, uh, right? So this is the exactly. GitHub repository and it's a build tool. So first of all, we need the build tool. Why do we need the custom build tool while I'm cloning this? So th this was sort of developed, this is this is a lot of history here, but this was um, built or developed early on in the Graal project when we realized we had to deal with uh, sort of C++ code bases, Java code bases. We also wanted a convenient way, a one one entry point for both building things and then executing the things that are built by the build process. So it, it is it tries to sort of do both the job of something like Maven with you know, building a dependency management, and it, also things like Git and the, uh, at, at the early stages the Mercurial HG command where it has a bunch of sub commands that can sort of run things within within its control. 
So MX is, is something that both builds all the parts of GraalVM and is used to run and launch and verify and check and all sorts of, it, it's, it's the way we interact with the code base. <clears throat> Um, so yes, once you have that, you're going to need to get Graal itself, right. also from so, GitHub. Right. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna uh, wait. Git clone, Git clone GitHub, Git clone Oracle slash Graal, and this is a fairly large repository, as far as I understand. So if you just want to look at the sources, maybe you want to use the shallow clone where you only clone like one, the latest kind of sort of revision. Uh, but we here we have like a like a, a fast internet connection from the cloud to some other cloud machine, I assume. So it's getting done fairly, fairly fast, right? Okay, and as that's pulling down, I can sort of just briefly in the same way that Maven organize yeah, all of these build tools have a way they structure code into modules or projects. So in MX the con top level concept is a suite, uh, which is sort of reflected in directories here. So if you look in the Graal repository, you'll see a bunch of directories and each of these is uh, an MX suite. Um, compiler being the one we're most interested in today. So you, you, you use MX within the context of a suite, which usually means you go into this directory and there'll be a bunch of MX extensions specific to this suite. Um, right. And then a suite is made up of projects, uh, which is similar to, I think, the odd concept of a project in Eclipse or a module in IntelliJ on NetBeans. So we're going right. to the... Right. So <coughs> those are the, the components, right? The main repository yep. has the compiler and uh, a dispressor, which is Java on Truffle, and the substrate VM, which is the runtime components for the native image, LLVM Bitcode interpreter, the tooling, the Truffle framework. Uh, VM is, I think, interesting. VM uh, is the, the meta suite, right? The, the... Yes, it's sort of the, the integration point in which um, the most interesting Graal VM binaries are built. It's the thing that draws together all the dependencies and knows how to place them into a, a final configuration, um, which is right. This is where Very we build right. our Graal VM CE. Um, okay. We're gonna we, we're gonna concentrate on changing the and looking at the compiler and building the compiler. So we we will go into the compiler uh, suite in a second. But I think I need to put MX on the path. You need MX on uh, the path, and actually one other thing you need is a base JDK. We don't have a JDK yet. Oh, that is true, right? So I this machine has the uh, has the uh, what does it have? It has the Java here installed, right? So I can run my Java commands here, uh, and this is the the the, the installed Graal VM. But we need a custom like a sort of like a specific right. JDK, right? Which is the Labs JDK. Uh, right. So the reason we have Labs JDKs, which are slight, as of 11 and later, they are slight uh, deltas uh, or forks of the stock JDKs. Um, and this originates from, we started the project when there was only uh, JDK 8 and we were developing JVMCI, the Java Virtual Machine Compiler Interface. And this is the layer that allows uh, hotspot in particular to talk to a Java level component in terms of asking for compilations to be done, receiving code to be installed and answering questions such as give me your methods, give me your classes, give me your uh, bytecode. It's, it's, it's a bit like Java reflection, but, but on steroids. And then <clears throat> since, I mean, this is an interface in the sense that we need to get across this language boundary. It's not an interface in terms of a well publicized, stable, um, backwards compatible API that you know is, is like a JDK API and therefore we need to iterate quickly on developing this API <clears throat> and for this reason we make we do the development in these JDK forks and and as regularly as possible we upstream the changes so there's there's only a slight lag usually between our labs JDKs and and what'll land in um, upstream right, a, uh, right like the JDK 11u repository so i think i found the latest build here yes. which is like from five days ago and i will pick what i will pick i will pick the love jdk community edition 11 based 11 jdk 11 based right and this is the build of the jvmci that goes in so this yep. love jdk contains consists of like two parts 
Oh no. Yeah, yeah so two dimensions of versioning there. The, the, right. the, the, so the stock I will versioning just... and the JVM CI API versioning. I will v get it and I need to uh, untar it, right? So yep. this would be tar minus extract z files uh, labs JDK. And we have it here. So this is my labs JDK. Yep. So now I want to set that I guy need... to be Java home. Right. So I will export my Java home, right? So it's a uh, echo now Java home should point go into labs JDK and I will put yep. MX on the path, right? So Excellent. now we have which MX, very good, very good, right? So now I can, I'm ready to build, right? Yep. I'm ready to build. I will go into the compiler and I do MX, uh, build. MX build. <laughs> Duh. Uh, I know that MX is a very powerful build tool. Like there are like a ton of commands. <laughs> Yes, yes. So, if you so, just do MX without anything, you'll see a, a, a list of what's what's possible there. Um, uh, MX minus help, or just MX help will tell you even more. Right. So we are building a Graal VM now, right? We are building, yes, a Graal VM in a certain configuration. Um, I, I received a, from a side channel notification that my video has disappeared so hopefully this is something yeah, you're back you can you're take back control of. all right all right good uh, right um okay so a, once a certain configuration yeah. right can you elaborate on that right so what i can what we can do after this is uh, run another command that will show us um what components are going to go into the graal yeah what we're building here is something that looks like a jdk um, or it is a JDK just with extra things dropped into it. Um, since we're focusing on the compiler here, the only extra thing dropped into there is um, an update of the, uh, the Graal module in the JDK, which has the name JDK internal VM compiler. Um, but as you build bigger and bigger VMs, you may drop in other components such as languages or native image. Um, okay, so we finished building here. If we run MX Graal VM dash uh, hyphen show. Oh, okay. Right. All right. So okay. this is the configuration we built. We built something that has Truffle, has a disassembler, has the Sulong tool chain, has Truffle NFI, the compiler, nice. and the SDK. Nice. nice. Very good. No, and if we no. want to find out where that thing was built, we do instead of GraalVM show, we say GraalVM um, home. home. Home? Yep. Oh, very good. Okay, so this is this. I can use this as the JDK now, right? I you could use this as, yes, this is a, a standard okay. JVM that now uses the GraalVM compiler uh, instead of the C2 compiler as the top tier. Um, right, right. Okay. Compiler. Okay, so we can build it now. What what else should I do? What's okay? Next? So now we want to start looking at the sources. Now we can bring up you know a text editor, but you know this is this is Java development, so we use IDEs. Um, and to make this make life easier, we have also an MX a command called MX. Uh, I think you use IntelliJ, so we're going to do MX IntelliJ init. And what IntelliJ this will do is init. exactly this will create IDE configurations specific to IntelliJ, such that we can now browse the uh, IntelliJ, uh, the source in IntelliJ. Right, okay. So you're gonna have to open IntelliJ and then uh, open these generated uh, project definitions. Right, so here's my IntelliJ idea. Uh, and here's my, uh, here's my new project wizard, right? So we're gonna, we're gonna go and uh, we're going to open the streaming setup, which is where we sit, live streams, Graal, compiler, compiler, right? Right. And hopefully it should import itself and run everything. And it shows us the readme file. If I'm not oh, that's interesting. Mistaken. Right. Uh, All right. Yeah, the, the readme file. And that's this is awesome. a very handy file for, you know, in case there's more detail in here than what we're going to go over today, but this should be also another uh, useful entry point in terms of getting set up started uh, with compiler focused development. 
Right. Um, so we're going to give it a second to import everything. Yes, nicely. while it's doing that, why don't we go back to the command line? We can just uh, one other interesting thing, one other aspect we care a lot about in GraalVM development is some sort of consistency among the uh, uh, consistency in the code base. And so we're leveraging tools such as check style, uh, again, through MX. So if we just run MX check style, it's going to run check style with our <coughs> customized rules over the code base. Oh. Did we run those and on every like PR? Team? We run this on every commit to the central repository so that nothing gets in uh, that sort of violates the coding conventions as can be expressed in Checkstar. We also run the Eclipse uh, code formatter in a standalone or in a batch mode. Um, so if you're wondering why the code looks like it does sometimes, uh, it's, it's coming from these, uh, these tools and nice. the conventions that have been adopted in these kind of environments. Those are Java tools, right? Do you know if any of those can be and were converted to native image? Could we have the I native don't image know. Check the style? Eclipse format tool is check style probably could be. Um, I, I, you know, uses a reflection, but I don't think in an aggressive way. The Eclipse right. formatter is an OSGI. I mean, it's an Eclipse application. Um, and I'm not sure if we can get that through native image at this this point in time. All right, yeah, this so this is an interesting this all passed. Uh, like home exercise for any of you and any of you who are watching the stream. Yeah, maybe try with the check style. Right, so the check style passed, of course, because I just cloned this. Maybe yep. we can run it later after I introduce my fat fingers into the yes. code base here. <laughs> right. And we also have, I think we have it here, right? So I can open the classes. I can open the class. What class should I open? Uh, Let's right, look at um, Brawl Compiler. Sounds like an Gra interesting one. Gra Gra Compiler. Very, very nice. Right. It is here. Yep. I have it open. And all you right, can so see it's indeed Java. As a true yep, connoisseur it's, it's all of Java. programming yes. languages, I can tell you that this is Java. <laughs> All right, you passed the test. Um, so this this is sort of the shared front end of the Graal compiler. And as it's Javanog says, it's it's something that will take a graph or work on on the, the actual class name is structured graph. Uh, <clears throat> but this is the internal representation used um, by the compiler at, at its front end. Uh, it lowers itself to another representation as it gets closer to code emission. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, a fairly intuitively named method here to compile. It takes an object called a request, which bundles up details of a compilation request and will return something called a compilation result. Um, now, this, this sort of shared entry point is used. Uh, maybe we can look at the callers of this method and you'll see, like, who, who, of the if compiler? this is the shared front end, yes, who uses this? Uh, what are what are what are sort of the front front ends? Um, right. Okay. So there is a compiler graph, graph, and maybe yes. I can look further. Right. Okay. Right. Now we start to see interesting stuff. So we got the hot spot hot spot graal compiler method or class. Uh, and this is the, the the path through which compilation comes when it's uh, a compilation request from Hotspot itself, uh, a tier four. Uh, tiered compilation request. You know, the, the interpreter's done its stuff, C1 has done its stuff, and it's saying, okay, now I want you to compile with an optimizing compiler, and we'll have an entry point, native entry point that ends up here. Uh, we see a bunch of tests here, which is interesting. You can programmatically invoke the compiler if you know how to build up the graph or a compilation request. We have the Truffle compiler. Uh, this is where Truffle partial eval evaluation enters into the core of the compiler. Um, what's interesting here is you know, Truffle, the, the, the contract with the compiler or the, yeah, the protocol operates on a graph. So partial evaluation will take bytecode in some form, also using components of the compiler, build a graph in a special partial evaluated form and just hand it off to the compiler. Uh, so in some sense, this is the back end of a Truffle compilation. And then the other entry point, there should be one here to do with native image. Um, it may be in a... It's uh, actually different. Uh, actually, it's not showing up here, but the, the native image tool also uses uh, the Graal compiler. It's, it probably sits in a different uh, MX suit that we didn't import here, maybe. 
that could be yeah. that's actually that's the case that's the case since we're focusing on the compiler and look, not looking at dependencies further further up right. or down in the dependency graph okay okay this is cool this is the truffle compiler calling like all, all those different use cases like kind of converging to using the Graal compiler this is really cool and this is also i assume that this the contract between truffle the framework and the compiler and that uh that is sort of uh, why truffle languages right work really well on graal vm uh absolutely the yes understands them the and truffle framework can... is a way to yeah, write your truffle languages but it does have this 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 tight uh, integration with the compiler where you can take your program and then okay. yeah feed it in as a graph it's very nice that we graal vm builds have the graal vm compiler in it <laughs> absolutely <laughs> right okay um, okay i see i see all uh, right so what yes, else? this is, this is we, we could expand it, but I think this is this is interesting enough in terms of uh, paths into compilation. Um, now we can sort of look at some interesting aspects of the compiler, which I would say sort of highlight the the, 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 the strengths of doing a compiler in Java. One of the interesting ones is a class called Compilation Wrapper. Uh, Let's see if okay. we can find that one. Compilation Wrapper. It's an abstract class. Absolutely. So each of those front ends that we'll call the Graal compiler will also have an implementation of this compilation wrapper class. And that's the thing that kind of says, okay, this is how I actually do, th this is how I will use that, that shared Graal compiler front end. Um, but what, what, what is in this uh, <coughs> framework, the compilation uh, wrapper framework is the support for attempting a compilation within an exception handler. I mean, that's kind of all it really is in, 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 in a boiled down sense. Uh, we are a, a Java program, not too different from any other Java program and exceptions can be thrown. Uh, we may have bugs in the compiler that cause null pointer exceptions or rebounds checks. Um, and it'd be a shame to you know, have the VM fall over as a result of a bad uh, compiler. Um, so what we can do here is we, we wrap every <coughs> compilation attempt in, a, in this glorified exception wrapper and um, we can take actions uh, on, on, on errors that uh, happen during the compiler. Um, it's both errors and bailouts. I'll get to bailouts in a second. Um, but this is, this is particularly interesting during development. We, we, we expect in production there to be very few, if any, compiler errors. Uh, that's why by default you run in this silent mode um, and the worst you'll see in production is you know maybe the vm isn't going as fast as you expect because certain compilations uh just don't happen uh in our development mode well the default is this diagnose flag uh, what's interesting here is when uh, an attempted compilation throws an error we will retry the compilation but turn on certain di diagnostics uh, one of the most interesting of which is to um, serialize out a, 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 a representation of the graph uh, into a binary for every single, or for well-known points through the compiler pipeline. And then at the end of the VM lifecycle, when the VM shuts down, it'll take all those serialized uh, graph forms and zip them up into a zip file. And this is something then is attached to our, our internal CI system build logs, or you know, if, it, if this happens in the field, we can ask a customer or a user to turn on this flag and then send us uh, these diagnostics. And it, it, makes, it makes solving a large class of compiler bugs uh, much, much easier. Nice. And then for our more aggressive gates, we'll go into the exit VM mode where we say, listen, we, it, we don't expect anything to go wrong here. If it does, please fail the gate collect the diagnostics, but don't don't try and continue running. Right, very cool. And I assume like most of the compiler, like tool chains have something similar, but it's nice to see that this is like, this makes use of like Java features that we use daily. Right, if, if you're on a runtime that allows you this sort of this sort of safer error handling, this is the sort of thing you want to do. It's, it's a bit harder and a more, uh, low level written compiler uh you know there is no runtime uh, handling for seg faults in, in the c plus plus kind of code base yes uh, that's that's when the vm goes down 
All right, so okay. so we use this to to handle compiler bugs, but uh, what's what's more commonly used here is this notion of bailout. It's also an exception. So if you look for a class called Graal bailout exception. Okay. Right. So this this is this is thrown through some certain parts of the compiler where basically the compiler said, no, I'm not I'm not interested in compiling. Uh, this input, there's there's a, a resource limit, or uh, there's, there's something about this code that I don't want to support. I don't want to support yet. Um, yeah. So if we if we look at some of the subclasses here, the names start to give it away. Uh, what kind of conditions might not be that interesting to compile? So this JSR not supported bailout. JSR is a, a legacy bytecode, uh, not present as of I think. Java six or seven, but we still have to run with old code bases, which may have these instructions. It's they're complex, hairy, and and only for a certain subset of these bytecode patterns do we want to support it. So we can, you know, we have the luxury of being a, a, a tiered execution system. We don't want to compile something. We can throw it back to the runtime, say, hand it to another compiler, or keep interpreting it. Another interesting one is this. Uh, let's see just at the top there, branch target out of bounds exception. So this is used, I think, in our ARM64 backend. Um, if you look at where it's instantiated, uh, called from, um, we might get a, a good insight there. Yeah, yeah. All right. R64. Yes. Exactly. So um, yes, this is interesting there. If we can bring that code into focus. Right, so in ARM64, there's a, uh, concept of near and far branches. This is uh, the way you can lay out code. And if, if you need to make jumps very far away in the code, you use a, a different type of instruction, which isn't as efficient. And, and it's something we'd like to avoid for most cases. So what we can do is we can say, listen, go and emit the code under the assumption that you can use near jumps everywhere. Um, and if we, if we get down to a point where we're trying to patch a, a jump instruction to its offset and we find that it, it's not it doesn't fit inside a, a, a near jump we'll just throw this exception and redo restart the code emitting again and say okay you know let's rewind and uh, turn off this assumption and now we're just going to go conservative and always use far jumps so it's a very very handy mechanism to, to do this sort of uh, back out uh, when when you want to try to do a compilation another way um, yeah, so this is this is one example of a bailout, um, and th there's a use of a bailout that that shouldn't propagate all the way out to the exception ra uh, wrapper. Some of the other ones, most of the other ones, will go all the way out and then hand hand the decision making back to the runtime. Uh, so yeah, let's look at some of the other ones there. Yeah, oh, yeah the, the graph, graph is, is too big. big. Now you, we should never, and we very very rarely see this in standard Java compilations. This can happen in um, truffle compilations. Usually I've been told as a result of a missing um, truffle boundary annotation. And I think the truffle language developers will know all too painfully what that is uh, or what that situation is. Right. Um, can, you, can you estimate yeah. like how big or like if I, if we talk about like a normal typical Java method, right? Like right. the size of the graph so the, the, the size of the graph varies throughout the compilation pipeline. We start with sort of very high level nodes, where the graph is quite small. We'll have nodes that match high level or high level in terms of Java bytecode. So we'll have a load field node. And at some point we start to get lower and lower in terms of the representation of the semantics of a node. So a load field node will expand into maybe a null pointer check and a, then a raw offset from an object pointer and, and an offset. So the, the graph gets a little bit bigger, um, but I would say, I mean, it's hard to say on average, maybe half thousand or a thousand nodes is, is not not uh, not uncommon. Right. So, so like too big is, is actually, like a thousand is not too, too big. Yeah, too I mean, big is... I think we, I'm not sure if one of the developers I was speaking recently had to try and debug a trough compilation which had a million nodes. Um, Obviously, something's gone wrong, but we we can support it and we can debug through this. So, yeah, that, yeah, is, that is awesome. Yeah, that is quite awesome. We need good tooling support. This is where we also, yeah, you know, we have this extra tool. We won't go into detail here. The DL graph visualizer or just graph visualizer, and this is where we can 
visualize, uh, I'm not sure if you have a screenshot, what, what our graphs look like once they're dumped out in these diagnostics. Um, All right. That's a yes. really handy tool. Putting me on the spot like that, I <laughs> I think I do have a screenshot, to be honest. Uh, it looks like a little bit like that. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Yeah, so. so actually, why you've got this here, this will be useful to set the scene for something else we're going to talk about. This is what a graph graph looks like. And it's 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 hopefully not too non-intuitive here. You know, you have an entry point called start. You're going to load an uh, int field from a, a class called objects hash. Uh, you're going to load another field. Um, actually, you're going to load three fields there. Do some checks or, or some uh, arith arithmetic on them and then return the result of that arithmetic. What's, what I'd just like to highlight here is these red lines or these red edges. This is sort of the fixed nodes in our control flow graph. Um, and the all the other nodes are what we call floating nodes. Now you can see it's all laid out in a, in a, in a scheduled form here where everything feeds into everything else. But during compilation, these floating nodes, they don't attach uh, uh, to the, the control flow in a fixed way. We can, we can move them around very easily. All right, right. so yeah, that's cool. That's cool to see a graph, actually see a graph, uh, much better than the traces to console. Right, so this is the, a graph consists obviously of nodes like vertices and edges between those, right? And it's yep. modeled using Java classes uh, yep. somewhere here in the code base. Absolutely, it's by classes called node and graph. Um, okay, makes sense. Uh, we, we try to be as intuitive as possible in our naming, in our naming uh, schemes here so if we look at the node so let's let's think of might be interesting in a in a graph representation it's it's sort of going over edges you know, for every node in, in compiler terms quite often you're interested in data flow and control flow um, data flow you want to say for this node think of an add node it, it's going to have two inputs a left and a right um, and these are the these are the inputs to the add node and then the add node itself is going to be used by maybe another add node, or it's going to be used by multiple add nodes or, or by a print line or some other instruction. That's the usage of the add node. So we have this concept of inputs and usages of a node. And we want to make modeling our inputs and usages as, as sort of convenient and as intuitive as possible. For your inputs, if you think of the add node, you're probably going to want to have an input called X and an input called Y or left and right. Uh, so if we can find an add node, um, uh, an I think add it's node? just called okay. add. Add node? Calcul yeah, it looks Notes, good. Notes, calculation, good. yeah. Now you won't see the fields here because we, we common things out into a binary arithmetic node. And if we maybe go to that one, binary ar arithmetic node, hopefully here we start, uh, that's a binary node. And in binary node, we should see an X and Y. There we go. So these are the inputs to every binary node, you know, minus nodes, plus nodes. Um, and I think this is as natural as the way you can get in terms of expressing inputs. Uh, it's just fields on a node. The only extra, what well, the extra magic we have here is this at input annotation. And what this allows us to do is to provide an automatic mechanism. If we go back to the node base class itself, uh, right, I'm here. I'm looking at the actual. Uh, you're, yeah, input okay. Uh, okay, good. Good. Then look for a method inside this class called inputs. In, inputs. Inputs. Right, I, I see inputs. Exactly. Yes, so it gets some sort of iterable. Right. So one might think that the way you're going to be able to iterate over the inputs of any node is you're going to have an abstract method here called inputs and every subclass, which has inputs is going to have to sort of override that method and provide an iterator to go over its fields. Here we get to use some of the, the, the beauty of Java um, with reflection, annotations, and unsafe. And to, you know, long story short, uh, for every node class, we have a, an instance of a node class. And this is in the same way you have Java lang object and Java lang class. This is just a layer, a, a, a way to have more stuff that you would ideally like to put in the Java lane class of the node uh, subclasses. But since you can't, we have an extra class which every node points to. Um, and inside there, we can we can pre-compute stuff 
uh, that makes things like what we're going to talk about here with inputs uh, um, possible. So what we'll do is we say, with reflection, go over all the fields of a node class and its subclasses and look for things annotated with uh, at input and use the sun misc unsafe facility to say, what is the input of that? What is the offset of that field? And then we just collect up in an array the, the offsets of all the input fields. And then we want, when we want to iterate over all the inputs, we simply, yes, we go into here and we go into the iterator. And at some point here, we're going to go to get input. So what uh, we're looking at is a yes. bunch of, yes, exactly, a bunch sort of iterator bookkeeping. But it boils down to this edges dot get node unsafe. And this mask is uh, a, a it, it really is just, yeah, a, an offset into the node object. And uh, this will be a read, an unsafe read. If we go into that method, edges get node unsafe. You see yeah. it boils down to calling unsafe. It just says, add this object, read this offset. Um, so what this means is we don't have to burden the, the, node de uh, the, the compiler developers who add new node classes, how to participate in iterating over, iterating over inputs. All you have to do is annotate your fields and you get it for free. And you get it fast. I mean, I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with unsafe. Uh, you know, this is a native method call. And so you'll think, oh, you know, it's doing a native method invocation every time for every input. But uh, any any Java compiler worth its salt will intrinsify this method, which basically means it'll recognize a core to this method while it's compiling this code and replace it with something that effectively ends up being one or two machine instructions. Uh, yeah, we do this, C2 does this, this is a well-known trick. We go a little bit further, but uh, I'll get to that uh, in a bit. Right, so what I hear here is that we have this Java representation of the uh, control flow graph and we just the compiler is literally really just works on that transforms it uh, and then kind of transforms it finally to the lower level machine code right and then uh, we use like all kinds of optimizations uh, to to make that also not just efficient as the like in a functional sense like to be like to produce as the best machine code possible but we also care about the performance of the actual compiler like workloads right yeah the and way we, we express it we we care about peak performance the quality of the compile code and compile time right and we use java facilities like uh like java language mechanism to to kind of make that useful and nice right so like annotations right. here for the input that is right cool. so so we get to use the nice abstractions but we don't pay for them uh since we can you know we're a compiler and we compile ourselves so we can <laughs> we can make it all go away <laughs> Uh, sounds sounds like rust. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, metacircularity rocks. Uh, um, right, that is awesome. Uh, do you have any more examples of that, or how do? Ah, uh, yeah, we can look at it in terms of using annotations. Look, let's look at a class called Dral Compiler Options. Uh, okay. Uh, wait. Dral Compiler op Options. Okay, nice. Uh, I see. Exactly. It's a short exactly. class. It's. It is, it's, and, and these are these are sort of the so options are things that uh, commonly you you may want to control from the command line. Um, so all of these are exposed as system properties that are prefixed with Graal dot. Uh, so if you want to set any of these on your JVM command line, you'll have some like minus D Graal dot print compilation, for example, and this will turn on uh yeah some level of uh compilation tracing now what's what's what we wanted to avoid is having sort of just one big global location where all the options are specified you really want to keep options close to their point of use uh so uh, we have something called the graal compiler class and it has options so we just put the graal compiler options as a class right next to the graal compiler class uh, and all we have to do is use this this, this one object type op, option key to declare a field, a public study final field of type option. Uh, using generics, we can say whether it's a Boolean, a string, an integer, an enum constant, and that's that's pretty much it. Um, 
And then we use this annotation, add option. And what this does, uh, actually a good way to explain this is if you look at the print compilation option. Oh, okay, sure. And let's look at its usages. We will see two usages. One of which is the actual code that relies on the option. Um, okay. Compilation printer, for example. Uh, then nothing much to explain there. This this code is going to say check the option. Uh, if it has this value, do this, do that. But what's more interesting here is the um, usages in generated code. Okay, I see. All uh, right. So I, so exactly. there's this class, right? Option right. descriptor. Exactly. Okay, so this is a generated class. We have a, a annotation processor which will find all of these annotated um, add option fields and generate an option descriptors implementation. Now, option descriptors is a service API. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, service loader framework in Java, it's a way to sort of say, find me in the code base or the implementations of this service interface. So this is the way we can sort of distribute our option declarations to the places where they most naturally lie, um, but still collect them all in, in one centralized uh, uh, manner. There's no, not every option doesn't have to kind of register it, register itself. All they have to do is uh, use this annotation. That so again, you know, cool. things like the Java annotation framework are very handy here. That is, that is very cool. Uh, I, I like more and more that it's written in Java. Like, so I'm not a like C or C++ developer. So if any of uh, those people proficient with those are watching, please forgive me. But like this, I understand, right? And like, as a, I would expect that any Java developer, right? With some experience working on some like Java code bases would be able to like decipher this specifically with all this, like the support that IDE provides. Absolutely. Is, and and, and we'll show this in more detail. All right. Do we use any other like Java features? Like I just. Um, Ooh, is it my internet? Could be my internet. Maybe not. I'm losing Doug. Doug, are you with us? Let, let's assume. Right, Doug, you're back. I lost you yes. for a second. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. The yeah. The, the only constraint we have at the moment is for the majority of the code base is to stick to JDK eight features. Um, since we want to grow, it, it does currently work in a JDK context, and that's it's something we plan to maintain for a while. As long as JDK is popular, there'll be a Graal VM for JDK eight. Um, and this brings us to one other one last feature I want. Actually, one the next feature I want to show is something called Graal services. How do we how do we have one code base that operates on all these JDK versions? What we need to do is abstract over um, exactly Graal services. So this is sort of, for one of a better term, this is an interface description. It's not really an interface. What we're gonna what we use here is something. Um, what's the term? Multi-release uh, modular jars. So th this thing describes services that are used by the rest of the compiler um, which have different implementations depending on the jdk version so let's skip past these load ones and go to the get class file as stream i think it's called there you go it's right there okay uh, yep right so and the Graal services class here is the 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 contract sort of the, interface, the contract right so it absolutely just does nothing here but it does nothing here. comes from the multi-release jar class right exactly at, at runtime it's a think of overlays we will overlay for your java runtime the right implementation of Graal services right so i but have here think, the for jdk 11. you have the 11 one so this, this the one method we're looking at is how do you get the the, the bytecodes for a class file or how do you get the bytes for a class file on right. jdk 8 i think you use uh, class loaders directly as of JDK 9, once the module system got introduced, you have to go through the module API. Now, obviously, right. we can't write against the module API in code that must compile and run on JDK 8. So this particular file will be in a, a JDK 9 or greater only part of the code base. And as we compose our jars, or we compose the final module, we'll just overlay uh, this class file on top of the, the, the contract class file. And so at runtime, 
in a JDK 9 plus runtime, it's going to pick up this implementation. Yeah, that is so cool. This is one of the coolest uses of the multi-release jar that I've heard of. Uh, yes, I, I, I I'm other, very glad like, you made me aware of it. Libraries, I don't remember that. I don't remember that. You remember that, but I don't. Uh, I think libraries actually use multi-release jars as well, but uh, this is a really neat way, right? Declaring a kind of like a contract file because the multi-release jar, the class implementations, they cannot kind of change the schema of the class. So you have to conform to the same signatures, uh, but you can have the different implementation within the method. Absolutely. Bodies. So yeah, that no, is very cool. Very nice facility and it's great we can use it. Okay, so another interesting, this is getting particularly interesting for those who want to start hacking on the compiler is typically, at least in my experience, when you want to test a compiler, you're going to have to construct some kind of program you can run, which will exercise the compiler uh, in the way you want to test the part of the compiler you want to test. And, and the path from, you know, running something on the command line to the compiler doing what you want can be quite convoluted. Now, being a, 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 a Java code base, we can leverage the fact that you can sort of kind of point into any part of a class, a jar, and, and just you know execute stuff there. Uh, so we, we can do this thing, you know, white box test, white box testing quite effectively. And a good example of this is the uh, compare canonicalizer test class. If you want to bring that one up, uh, wait, wait. Um, can you call that again? Say that again. Uh, yes, compare. Canonicalizer uh, test. Can canonical test. Right. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. Test, test, test two, test three. Yes. I like yes. The, the naming <laughs> conventions there. <laughs> yes. Um, not, not all of our naming is super intuitive. For tests, we're not as stringent as for the rest of the code base. So canonicalization is the term not only we, but it's quite, yeah, you, you want to take something and sort of reduce it to a more canonical form. Um, right, so it's a, so, it's a graph yes. transformation, right? It's a graph it's a... transformation, yes. Think, think, think of a node that does, you know, A plus zero. You want to canonicalize that to a node that just is A. Uh, and so uh, what we want to do here is if you look down to what is the method I had in mind, test integer test. Oh, test integer test, okay. Yep. Uh, we use the convention most unit you know j unit tests start with the name test um so <clears throat> what we're going to do here is we're going to say go and find a method using reflection inside this class called integer test plus some suffix so you'll see okay. probably yeah right below you there they are integer test one two three and there'll be a four okay now if we look at the get canonicalized graph uh, okay yep so we, we We've got the name of the method we want to do now. And this, the, the, our superclass graph compiler test has all the facilities for using Java reflection to go look up that method, ask the VM for its bytecodes and parse it into a, a, a compiler graph without doing any extra, any other work on it. It's, it's the entry point compilation. Right, so now we, all we care about, yep, sorry. Yes, sorry. yes. Yeah. Okay. And the only thing we care about testing here is what does the canonicalizer do to this graph? We don't, and we don't have to, we don't want to have to fight, okay, what, what phases come before canonicalization and the pipeline? Uh, are they going to change our input such we're not running the test we want? The nice thing is we can just say, take this graph, apply this single transformation to it, and then look at the result and make some assertions about it. Um, right. So it's this really sort of uh, laser focused way to test uh, the internals of a compiler. And if we look at where this was used, where we came from, uh, you can get... Okay. Right, so we, we are specifically testing one phase here, one optimization, and I assume here we, we get the graph, we apply the transformations, and then we check some... Some property. That the transformation was kind of sort of what we had in mind when we were writing this test. Yes, and and yeah, you know, what we expect here, like you know, the graph dot start, we expect this to have been canonicalized. That the entry point of the graph, the only thing that is left is the return node, and then hanging off the return node are the nodes that do the computation 
of, I don't know, what is integer j right? Does x and y equal zero? So we expect the return node to have an input, which is a conditional node. So that's your and condition. The and condition is going to have two inputs, x and y, which come from the parameters, x and y. And this is all neatly modeled and you'll see, you know, pull out the integer test node, pull out the parameter node, and then we can make some assertions. Right. Do these okay. do these things have the values we expect? So you, know, you can't get more precise than that in terms of writing a compiler test. And we have right. this littered throughout our, our, our unit test uh, code base. That is very cool. And I assume like we can do this for like more complex uh, uh, phases and transformations as well. Yeah, if, we, if... We, we can take a graph and apply a set of phases put together. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff you can do once you've got the internals. So if, if I find a use case where the performance of GraalVM isn't up to my expectations and I will like send an issue, create an issue, then you can just look at the code reproducer that uh, like the issue has and kind of turn it into a test like this. Uh, yes. And then after fixing the issue, if there is an issue that will never regress back. Yeah, it's, it's actually a very common you know, process we take when triaging bug reports. Yeah, can we, the first thing we do, can we write a unit test for it that, that reproduces the, the error? Um, and then we just have debug that test into correctness. And now we have the fix and uh, a regression test. Um, of course, not all bugs uh, are going to work that way, but a nice. large set are. So that's, nice, that, nice, that's nice. how we do this nice white box test. And we can also do white box benchmarking, um, which allows us to, this is sort of important, this is particularly important in the early days of the compiler where we care and we still care about compile time, but as you're developing a compiler infrastructure, you want to say, uh, is this facility, can it be made more efficient? So we saw before the way we iterate over inputs. Um, and there's one, the, if we go back to the edges class. Uh, edges, Just Sorry. edges. Edges, yes. Right. And it's yeah. exactly here. So we, we saw that this boils down to an unsafe call. Um, we already, as I said, as a, a good Java compiler, we will intrinsify that to be uh, a one or two machine code instructions. Um, but what we'd also like to get rid of, because we suspected it, it does add some overhead, is you know, unsafe just returns a type object. And Java rules therefore require you to you know, cast that object to what you believe is in there. Now we know, because we wrote the compiler, every time we pull something out through this unsafe access, it really is going to be a node class. So we, we don't really need this type check. So we added a compiler intrinsic, which we can look at in um, standard graph builder plugins, I believe is the standard name of the class. Standard graph builder, okay, this one? Standard yes. Standard graph builder plugins. And there should be a thing called register edge. Edges plugin. Okay, I there see. It is. Right here. Yep. Right, there are quite, okay, a, so, quite a bit of plugins there. Okay, we'll look at this yes. particular one. So, what are these plugins? Uh, this is a way where we can uh, hook into the bytecode parser. This is a thing that'll parse through the bytecode of a method and create a compiler graph, a structured graph. And every time we get to an invocation in that graph, it's going to ask a set of registered plugins, hey, do you know something special about this? Can you do something with this? Or should I either emit an invoke node or inline into this, this uh, method? And quite often uh, you can, this is called intrinsification where the compiler says, listen, I know how to implement semantics of this thing. I trust this code hasn't changed from what its defined semantics are. Uh, up until this point. So I will just use the most efficient compiler representation I have to implement the semantics. So here we'll see um, for this get unsafe uh, method. Okay, how does this work? We have a registration object it says, give me a registration object for the edges class. And now I'm gonna register plugins for certain methods in that class. And it's all symbolic based here, symbol based. So we say, I wanna find the, the, red, the method called that starts with get, and in this case, node right, so unsafe. Get node unsafe and get node list unsafe. Exactly. And we sort of patch them with what I understand is like the kind of like manually constructed 
graph because this yep. is like the node. So yes. it, the compiler doesn't see what's in the actual class. So like- It won't go and look at the bytecode, exactly. Right, so it just like has this as a representation. That is a yes. very neat way to do intrinsics. Yes, and, and, and actually the intrinsification we're doing here is exactly what we would do for a normal unsafe intrinsic. Uh, the only extra thing here is, I won't explain in great detail, but the stamp factory step is saying, tell the compiler the result of this load is of this type. And in this case, it's, you know, node. And so that, the, the thing we return is a raw load node who says, oh, mate, the, the, the object I load has this type node. And in the bytecode, what you'll see next is a, a check cast, since that's what was written in the method. and the compiler said, well, I don't need to check cast that a node is a node and I'll just eliminate this check cast instruction. And so we, we were, yeah. So this is this is an example of how one intrinsifies, um, intrinsifies methods. That is, that is very cool. I don't know yeah. what I imagined the intrinsics were, but I, I assumed it is like harder than this because this I can, this I can fiddle with myself, right? Right. Uh, Probably not to the greatest effects, but uh, I can I can fix another. Well, not all intrinsics are this straightforward, but yeah, there are some times where it really is. It is as simple as this. Right. Uh, very cool. Can I can I run something? I am yes. Not sure so whether... what what we can do is we can show the benchmark and we did around this exactly this intrinsification. How did we test that this is fast? And we have a, a benchmark for this. If you look for the class called Node Bench benchmark uh okay uh note ben note benchmark yep and in here is a method called inputs exactly okay inputs all right so this uses uh, a set of nodes which is built which is constructed in the benchmark setup step and all we do is we just go over the set of nodes and iterate over the inputs of each of those nodes and okay. all we want to do is benchmark this so if we go to the command line uh, for those okay. of you familiar with it so you'll recognize this is a jmh benchmark and i hope you have the pre-cooked command line for running this because it's, it's a bit of a mouthful right i have i have this what you sent me right so we exactly. do mx and we say benchmark and we yep. provide the yes we have this suit? benchmark harness that can run a whole lot of different sorts of benchmarks by category and they have names so we won't go into too much detail here. Just suffice to say, this is how we're going to run this benchmark. Um, uh, yes, first thing it's going to do is you know, complete uh, constructing the VM for this. This is a one-time step. Takes a little bit of time here. <laughs> yes, but... the problem is as of JDK 11 to build a VM, you need to run JLink. JLink is not not the fastest of uh, build steps. All right. Okay, we got the running the benchmarks. So we are running node benchmarks inputs uh, yep. and we see uh, the results. All right, so this is measured in operations per second. That number should get faster and faster as Graal itself gets faster. And faster. So we're in a process where Graal is compiling itself here. Once we see the stabilized, we know we have a, a certain result. And then what might be interesting, uh, I think you have the, the pre-cooked code, we can sort of uh, modify the uh, benchmark, no, modify the standard graph builder plugins to have use a system property to disable this intrinsification. We can see what impact this has. Uh, right, so if I just take this exactly, and I will delete this the... yep i will delete this i will delete this and i will but we're gonna paste this my machine is being a little bit uh no not ah, you know we can just leave it like this save it and and now we don't have those intrinsics oh, actually no it's not going to work because there's a call to register oh there we go this. okay thank you all right so all right. we added the system property and we yep. added the system property to say, like, if it's done, like, just return. Yep. Right. So we are not doing anything, any application of those 
or here. Yeah. Okay. So there's a quick so hack to the compiler which shows us how, how to modify it, how to build it, that we can log from it very easily. So if we go and do MX build again. Uh, okay, MX. Command line. I, I will stop this, right? So we had sure. like a few. Okay, good, good. Right, we have one iteration there. I will stop it and then we'll save this uh, data. I'm not sure I need that data, but. Uh, it's 3.5. Three yeah, it looks like we get right. 3.5 million MX, operations per second. MX built, MX yep. built. MX built. I hope this will uh, fairly fast. Yeah, um, this, this is incremental. We don't have to rebuild everything again. And then we're going to run the benchmark again, and we can add that uh, system property uh, to disable the intrinsication. And uh, if all goes well, we're going to get something slightly three and a half million operations per second. If not, we'll right. put it down to uh, you know a cloud machine busy doing other things at the same time. Yeah, it does run the ID. It does run the right. Know, some other things. As so well. let's be honest. We don't have the most accurate uh, or, or, or uh, clean benchmarking environment. Right. Uh, excellent. Uh, All right. And then once we, we go to this, to and then we do. Uh, we need the set up Benchmark. the property, right? How do I, how do I, I just bring up the command line again? The MX benchmark uh, one. Oh, uh, okay. I will like, uh, maybe like this, right? Yes. So we just minus D slow edges. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, and it runs. Yeah, fingers crossed. And we're going to get, yeah, slightly slower, um, execution. And, and so the, the high order point here is this is how we've finely tuned certain parts of the compiler which we know are crucial to compilation time given that we operate in a JIT environment compilation time is, is quite important uh, and so you know we can we can find where things are slow and being a compiler that compiles itself we can we can address it um, when necessary right, right yeah, so we see a see bunch of out yeah that's how that's how you build a ground VM with your custom uh, absolutely custom code in it uh, right, I'm gonna continue running this. And what I want to thank you very much. Thanks for this hour with, with me looking through the code and teaching me various things about both the building GraalVM and how the compiler works. I think I have a much, much better uh, understanding of uh, certain concepts than before. Uh, than before. Great, great. And uh, yeah, so we look forward to many uh, highly productive pull requests from you in the in the near future. <laughs> Absolutely. Let me just unwrap my my uh, my compilation book, like how to write the compiler and go through it quickly. No problem. All right. And we uh, can see here, we can actually substantially slower um, uh, operations. Not I quite think half, this but... is the first one, like this is a million, right? And there we have... Yeah, yeah. For... But, yeah, but we had like already on something like uh, 2 million was Three. the first iteration. Uh, yeah was the thing nice right. nice so we successfully made it slower yes uh, which which for which... demonstration purposes we can we can we can make it a lot slower but yes this is this is uh showing off a few things here right uh okay all right thanks a lot um hey no worries. any of people who are watching unfortunately we don't have time for questions right now uh, but you can find Doug and you can find the rest of the team uh, in the community Slack. And we we are happy to answer questions there. And as Doug said, we are absolutely uh, always welcome all the contributions. So if you have any ideas how to how to improve things, please talk to us. If you have like some sort of benchmarks or code samples where you think performance is not up to your expectations, uh, talk to us as well. Right. As you saw, there's like it's all Java, so we probably can make it faster. Uh, so that is that. Yes, and we get to two million uh, instead yes. of like three and a half million. So that was Absolutely. quite a substantial performance degradation that I just introduced there. <laughs> right. Do not open a Thank PR. You. All right. Hey, thanks right. a lot, Oli. Thanks a lot. Uh, see you online. Thank you very much.